think I also got drunk at a Chili's one time and stole a spoon from there, too. <laughs> I feel God in the Chili's tonight. <laughs> Everybody, welcome back to This Is My Birthday Podcast. I am your host, Harry. It is episode 123. Can't believe it. And with me, as always, are the co-hosts, Curtis and Swan. Guys, welcome back to the show. Hope you're enjoying isolation uh, in these COVID-19 times. Yeah, it's great. I've only talked to myself like four times today. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, I've... I think I beat your record. I've talked to myself about six times. So, oh wow, not good. He's got he's got your beat. <laughs> he's got your beat there, Swanee. <laughs> he definitely does. I started saying "we" out loud, and I was like, "I'm talking about myself." This is kind of scary. Ugh. 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 Yikes! Yikes! Well, that's okay because that's you know what we have to cure that is bourbon. I don't know if that's going to uh, cure we, it or it might just enhance it. To be yeah, honest, yeah, I think but, I, well, I think I just start talking to myself more after that. Yeah, after this podcast, I'm going to turn into an M. Night Shyamalan movie. (laughs) I see dead people. Anyway. um, I just want to be an essential worker. (laughs) Well, we start every episode out with Flying Blind, and if you listened to last week's episode, you know that these guys have a Flying Blind that's going to continue for a few weeks. Have you all found any differences uh, in in the nose this week as opposed to last? Yeah, this week it's coming off as a little more uh, fruity. I, yeah, I can I can totally see that. I would say fruity and even kind of uh, even a little bit dusty. Yeah, a little dusty, but honestly, it's not even like a artificial fruit. It's like when you open up one of those like. Have you ever had one of those giant edible fruit things and like you just have a bunch of fruit hit you all at once? There's no descript yes. like, yeah, this is this fruit. It's just that it's just all at once. Like a fruit roll up or a fruit, uh, fruit by the foot or something like that. Yeah, I guess maybe not as artificial. Are you talking like but an yeah. edible arrangement? Yeah, those things. Oh, OK. Like it just hits you all at once. You know, I mean, you, you don't get like one specific fruit. For me, I'm definitely getting more of a fruit note compared to last time it's also a lot lighter to me it's not as uh as strong as what it was last week it definitely has a lot of it's got a decent amount of age on it it feels like though because i just went in for the power yeah Mm -hmm. and it's the fruit's not nearly as apparent on the palate but it it is Mm. i don't know the nose doesn't quite match perfectly i do like it though it's very uh, it feels like a one solid experience, even if it's not super cohesive from nose to palate. Oh yeah, yeah. I, t- I I I totally agree with you. I think that the um the palate seems to kind of pump things up a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in terms of like the darker side of things, I know Kurt, you're probably leaning a little bit heavier on that. Uh, in 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 that case, and enjoying that that side of it. Yes. The, the I will say the finish is still a little bit short. Uh, as as compared to last week but oh, overall this is kind of a pleasing little experience it, it and i know you know what i'm gonna stop talking because i i don't want to i don't want to give too much away no keep going please yeah no real. no 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 because you guys still have to guess what you might think this is yeah, uh, dude, like you did last week the the palette on this is it's a really strong palette for me uh, it kind of gives this nice mouth feel kind of coats coats the mouth and also has kind of a a little bit of a tingling warming effect that some bourbons don't necessarily do i I really like it i can see that i think i have a guess at least for this week so i can be wrong multiple times um (laughs) and and by the way i want to establish this for anybody who didn't listen to last week's episode if they get this right, I will tell them straight off the bat and we'll just kind of continue to enjoy it for Flying Blind or maybe, you know, I'll try to find a way to get them other samples. Uh, last week, they did not get it. Uh, Swan guessed that it was a 50-50 blend of Elijah Craig Rye and Turkey 101. And Kurt guessed that it was around 112 proof. So you guys can give me any information you feel like, proof, age, distillery, uh, wh- whatever you kind of feel like this might be leaning towards. 
I, I will take into account and we'll compare it next week. All right. I think my guess is it's reminding me of a bottle. I both know that I know we both have this. Mm. The Larceny uh, Why So Delicious pick. Okay. It reminds me a lot of that, especially on the nose, not as much on the palate. But I, I, it's very close to that. I'm either mm. in the Jim Beam uh, camp as far as, dist- as distillery or the wild turkey camp. I lean more towards turkey and like you said dusty. So I'm thinking it's a dusty, a dusty turkey of some sort of, uh, of matter, but I'm not sure which one. A very interesting choice there, Curtis. Okay. Uh, I can confirm that neither of you all have guessed correctly. Dang it. This week. Um, good guesses as always. But uh, you, you continue to play for another week, and uh, we'll, we'll find out what it actually is in uh, three more flying blinds. With, gotcha. Uh, Can Swan. we get like a hint or a little, you know, just tidbit of information? Here, I got one. Is it made in Kentucky? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, it is made in Kentucky. Boom. Look at that. Narrowed it down. 49 <laughs> states that, out of here. Is that all get out did? of here, District of Columbia. Both of you all have been close in certain regards, but not right on the head. So you can you can take that however you want to. Um, there are aspects of it that you might be able to kind of ascertain in order to make guesses in the future, but you guys have you guys have made guesses that will influence the final reveal. Is that mysterious enough for you? <laughs> yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> I might have gone too mysterious. I'm not sure, but we'll we'll certainly find out. Anyway, that was uh, that was flying blind, and I uh, I like I like this one. I like this one quite a bit. But you know what else I like is hearing what you guys have been drinking recently. Uh, so I've been drinking a Johnny Drum that I've had that I haven't opened up in a long time. And I've uh, been pretty solid with it. Been pretty happy with how it's been tasting. Interesting. And then I also have been drinking the E. H. Taylor small batch uh, bottle and bond that I picked up uh, about a month ago, month and a half ago. And I- I've talked about this one before, so I won't go into it or anything. But uh, just a solid. I, this is I. I'm kind of new to the E. H. Taylor as much, and uh, just very happy with it. Uh, I've been having a little bit of everything, so I've had uh, some Elijah Craig. Isolation will do that to you. I know, right? I was like, well, just these bottles I've been saving. What if I'm dead tomorrow? You know, just let's dip into <laughs> them. So uh, I've gone through and had two of my higher proof Elijah Craig barrel proof releases. Um, and then I've had some uh, Knob Creek, that pick that I gave you, the No Country for Old Men. Great yes. name, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um. No spelled N O E. Yeah, N O E. And then the most recent stuff I've been revisiting the Bell Mead uh, cask finished bourbon. So, like, the, I've had two specifically. I'm going to have the third one while we're talking tonight, but I've had the Sherry cask finish, just the generic release, and the Cognac finished one. And then tonight I'm going to be having the Madeira finished one as well. Yeah, and the Madeira finish was uh, well. We that was kind of the one that we didn't touch on. Is that is that right? When we did that episode, I think so. Yeah, we we all unanimously decided that the sherry one was the better of the two we tried. Uh, but I don't think we touched too much on the Madeira, mostly because it looks like there's next to none of it gone. So <laughs> that that sounds about right. But I uh, so we we kind of continued this. Uh, this new tradition this past weekend of doing some kind of collaboration with some communities, uh, some different channels rather in the, uh, the bourbon content creator community um, where we did a live stream over on the, the YouTube channel on Saturday night. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. We had uh, the, the Scotch test dummies, uh, Scott from Scotch test dummies rather uh, bourbon blind was on there. Uh, I whiskey, she wines. Uh, it was a it was a really fun 
little uh, couple of hours that we all got to spend hanging out and uh, drinking together. I honestly cannot remember what I got into that night because it was a very long day of drinking because before that, we also did a Patreon uh, hangout. I can tell you a couple of things that I haven't having recently. Uh, one is a Woodenville Bottle and Bond five-year-old bourbon that was sent to me by Joseph Brazo uh, from all the way out in uh, Washington State. They are on lockdown right now, and uh, Joseph wanted to get that out to me. So, Joseph, thank you so much for sending me that. I just revisited the uh, Jim Ream pre-pro Jim Beam rather uh, <laughs> pre-pro. Whew, words, man. Uh, pre-pro. Yeah, Jim Bream. Come and try our bourbon. Oh no. Anyway, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I, I, the Jim Beam pre-prohibition style rye. Um, it's one of the older bottles, kind of like how we've been enjoying those older bottles of the bonded. Um, this is spectacular. It is a very, very good rye. It's only 90 proof, uh, but it's really got a lot of body to it. I think they did a great job with it. And of course I am spending, uh, time taking my medicine as well and drinking at least 120 proof bourbons, uh, as often as possible to ward off the COVID-19 fears. Guys, we got some uh, we got some news to get into this week. We do, uh, unless there's unless there's anything else that you all have been drinking that you wanna wanna talk about. Uh, I've been I've got a little early times poured right now. The bottle and bond. Oh, interesting. It's a uh, it's good to revisit. I've got one of the initial run that they did where everyone kind of wanted to collect it. I just opened it to try it. It doesn't. It's not super noticeably different from the one that's currently on the shelf, sure. but it's uh it's definitely good. Definitely worth keeping one. I mean, it's nice that it's a one liter bottle for like 20 something dollars. Yeah, absolutely. I need to go back and grab another bottle of that. Kurt, what are you drinking on right now, buddy? Uh, I'm drinking on a Russell's Reserve right now. Nice. Very nice. And uh, as we've talked, it's uh, it's good. It's really good. Well, I just poured some uh, distiller's cut from Jim Bream. Um, <laughs> great <laughs> just guy. Just lean into it. <laughs> yeah, got to, I got to now. I got to now. Uh, so not a whole heap of news this week, but uh, some some things that we definitely should uh, touch on. First and foremost, uh, some news out of the San Francisco World Spirit Competition. The first being that the Barrel Craft Spirits Batch 21 was named the best bourbon uh, this year, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, it was both overall and in the six to ten year category. Um this is something really fascinating to me and something that I think that we're going to start seeing a little bit more over the next few years uh, as we kind of as we see distilleries that are maybe moving away from producing their own products and actually, you know, buying barrels from other distilleries and blending them to make their own. But on that note, it's still interesting to me that with, you know, these these companies that have such well-known products uh, that are also kind of mass batched, mass pro- mass produced with a product that comes from other distilleries. We haven't seen more of this before now. What do you guys think about Barrel uh, getting this honor at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition? I am all for it. They are an extremely experimental company and they're putting out a lot of good stuff and they did really well with uh, some of the stuff they did last year. I think their New Year's releases are great. I think the dovetail uh, whiskey, not bourbon, that they put out was a great uh, mixture that kind of competes with like that Murray Hill Club stuff that they put out. Sure. And uh, a lot of their regular releases are kind of hit or miss for me. But if you're looking to collect something that you can easily find and it's roughly the price of Booker's, I think it's right up there with it. As far as quality, um, you just have to kind of buy into their flavor profile, which I generally don't. But there's plenty of people to do. Yeah, for me, I mean, just being honest, I haven't really had, I don't even know if I've had any uh, barrel spirits, so I can't comment on that specifically, but uh, I mean, I'm definitely excited to try some. I'd be, I'd be down for that. Yeah, and I mean, maybe uh, once we're all able to get back together, we could, you know, actually do a review of one of their, uh, one of their batches, Um, because that's not something that we've really touched on in uh in in the past on the show 
Swan, I'm on board with you. I think that it's really cool to see that uh, that this is happening in the world. I think that uh, you know, as as great as seeing these kind of heritage distilleries continue to succeed and be recognized is, um, I think there's always room at the table for more. And this is definitely an indication that uh, that there are good things to come from some of the lesser known brands out there. So I don't know if this is going to be the big push that barrel bourbon needs um, in the coming months, in the next couple of years. But I mean, it certainly seems like something that's not going to affect their business in a negative way at the very least. No. And another thing I want to call out about them, they just put out a rye that has just an unbelievable yes. proof on it. Yes. Uh, Adam Terry sent this to us. Do you remember the proof on it, Swan? I don't. It was like 148 or something up there. Oh, What's no. It? Oh, no. It was 153.6. 153.6. Yeah, that's just insane. <laughs> I mean, if you need something to fight off the virus. That's that's your ticket. That's your, that's ticket, your ticket, right ticket right there. Right there. I have never had a whiskey that high of proof before, and I would love to try it. I would absolutely love to try it, but holy crap. Yeah. I, I feel like I wouldn't be able to taste it anything for a good four or five days after trying that yeah i mean i've had i think the highest i've had that's still considered a bourbon was 144.1 mm. and it was a stag that, that stag yep. yeah the hazmat stag mm-hmm. and it's good i think that one specifically it doesn't drink like it's 144 but i think once you start getting over that at that point it's like you just have to enjoy a little pain alongside your bourbon. Like that's a tasting note at that point. It's just pain. Uh, but I, I don't know. I'd be curious to try it. If I see it out, I think I'm going to splurge and probably grab it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I would like to at the very least try it. And we are actually, I I've meant to talk about this before on the show. Um, we are going to be, uh, getting barrel, uh, barrel spirits on the show uh, sometime in the next six months to a year, uh, just depending on when all this kind of blows over, or maybe we'll do a, a, a Skype interview or something, but uh, we, we do want to connect with them and get to get them talking about their products on the show itself. So in the meantime, congratulations, barrel uh, craft spirits for your win at the San Francisco world spirit competition. This next one also comes from uh, San Fran. This is, pretty astounding to me this and is super cool yeah so uh breaking bourbon who is a a, a review aggregate site uh, friends of the show for sure um gotten to meet with them a couple of times really just at bourbon and beyond um but super super nice guys their uh their single barrel pick of hill rock which was called hudson confidential actually took home a gold medal at the 2020 San Francisco World Spirits Competition, making them one of the first single barrel clubs to actually medal at this competition. Well, wow. I am I am just amazed that well well first off, I didn't realize that clubs could submit a product to the the competition to, you know, try to compete against all of these other big name brands. A lot of the clubs, I mean, they sell every bottle they have of that particular pick before it even gets bottled. So I don't think many of them are concerned about submitting, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably a good good explanation is they probably aren't, mostly because they probably don't know that they can submit their bottles or their picks, you know? I, I bet you that's probably part of it as well. Uh, but either way, I think it's super cool, and hopefully you'll start see- seeing uh, some of these uh, awards being picked out uh, a little more in the future. Obviously, it won't you know, be a predominant thing, but it'll be cool, you know, a nice little uh, something like that every once in a while during these. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Kurt. We're not going to see a, a whole heap of uh, uh, single barrel clubs or, or local groups who have gone and picked out barrels actually, you know, submitting their their single barrel picks to these competitions. Yes, it is something you have to kind of pay to to be a part of and, you know, if you if you have that kind of 
revenue or that kind of money sitting around to be able to 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 put forth your product or to put forth your pick by all means go for it i think that's a a, a super interesting way to kind of make a name for yourself uh, in in this day and age i i really do hope to see more of this honestly i mean this goes back to us talking about barrel craft spirits you know we the the more that we can kind of you know expand the playing field the more that we can kind of open seats at the table for people the, the, I don't see anything wrong with it. I, I personally do not. And uh, it, it's just cool to see something as small as one group's single barrel pick being recognized at this high of, a, of an accolade. So, and, it, and, and by the way, it's not even a Kentucky bourbon. This is a New York bourbon. Yeah. Um, one I've not <laughs> been particularly fond of, just the regular release. Have you not? No, I'm not really. I wasn't big on it. It's the Solera cask finish, right? Well, um, that that is what they what they do with their regular release. Um, this one was finished in a uh, 20 year old Oloroso sherry cask. Oh, okay. So that total game changer. The Solera yeah. cask finish, I thought was just okay. I mean, it was a really cool looking bottle. I enjoyed it, but the price point was hard for me to really sit down and crave a glass of that. Sure. I have a bottle of it. And I mean, I'm, I'd be happy for you guys to try it next time you're around. Yeah. Just initial thoughts on what, what do you think? I, I like it. I really, it's, it's nice to find bourbons or whiskeys from outside of Kentucky that I um, can kind of go towards. It's not in my initial thought when I'm going, what am I going to have a drink of? But every now and then, it is nice to kind of pull out and uh, share with other people. I had it on a, a Patreon bonus episode with my dad uh, a couple months ago, and uh, it I, I I think that it's opened up a lot since I first got the bottle. Um, I was gifted the bottle itself, so I didn't actually pay for it. But I I think that it has um, a good a good amount of depth and complexity to it. Um, and part part of that definitely comes from the fact that it's Solera aged, or it's like an infinity barrel where you know some of the the whiskey itself is actually you know still hanging around in the barrel before it's dumped into bottles and everything. So I I, I like it. I, I again wouldn't say it's my favorite, but yeah. I think that it definitely has merits that it can uh, kind of rest upon. So definitely. So here here's something that I kind of wanted to touch on too. Uh, it's it's not necessarily. Um, The biggest of news, but it is something that people might not be aware of. And that is the fact that there are distilleries that offer free virtual tours of their property online. Uh, Two of which that have been prominent uh, are Buffalo Trace and Four Roses. And I I think that it's, look, it's not the same. No, it's not. it's, It's definitely not. But... There is so much to be learned, even just by kind of, you know, going through and doing the point and click thing and finding out about the, you know, their products and finding out about uh, the history that, you know, even when, you know, you aren't able to make the trip to Kentucky, it is, it is available to people still right now. I will say though, you guys kind of sounded like you had a little bit of disdain for this in your voice when I brought this up. It, are, do you not like this as much as I do, or what do you feel about? Uh, it? Yeah, so for me, I definitely think it's a great offer, and it's it's an alternative to uh, you know showing the distillery showing uh, how bourbon is made. So I think that's a great learning tool and a great uh, way to to show this, especially during a time that we're not able to go. Um, so I, I'm actually pretty forward. I think it's pretty cool. It's a cool resource. On the other hand, you definitely are missing, you're missing the smells. You're missing the, uh, informed tour guides that, that will be able to tell you, ask your questions, uh, or ask, answer your questions. Um, so it's definitely not the same as far as taste, the tasting experience. I think you definitely lose that uh, because you have people that during your tasting experience, they'll 
they'll talk about, okay, this is some of the notes that you would taste and um, just little fun facts, I think probably get lost within that. But in a time that you can't go to the st- distilleries, you can't expect probably that heightened experience like you do at the distillery. So I think it's pretty cool that it, it's still available. And I think Buffalo Trace had been working on this even before uh, COVID-19 and things like that. So uh, a cool feature. I, I mean, I agree with that completely. I think it's just such a sensory experience. I mean, yeah, there's two things you will never get tired of with Buffalo Trace in particular. It, the number one thing that I that always comes to mind is pulling up into the visitor parking lot and opening your door to the smell of Warehouse H. And just like all of that campus just smelling like a giant bourbon ball Rick House, that like huge enveloping smell that it's got. And then doing the, you know, at the end of the tour, after you've had Freddie, he pours, you know, white dog in your hand and tells you to, you know, do a few things and you kind of get to experience breaking down that in person. That's just something you're not going to be able to substitute with a virtual tour. But I do think this is a great option in the meantime. I just, I know that there's going to be some people that are going to look at that and not be satisfied. So they'll have to come back. And that's not a bad thing, but uh, it is nice to see if, I guess, if you even wanted to go visit Buffalo Trace or Fort Roses. I mean, what what do they have to offer? If their virtual tour is lacking, then maybe not go. But both of those definitely have a very flushed out visitor center and experience when you show up. So they should have no problem with this. Yeah, it doesn't compare to the uh, actual tour itself, but you should definitely go because <laughs> i can't agree more with yeah the... when you when you can <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah because yeah. i can't agree more when you're going coming up to a distillery you roll the windows down of your car and you're like oh wow it's a sensory uh experience for sure i i definitely do not disagree with you guys by any means i mean it, it everything about going to a distillery is such a hands-on visceral experience, but if, if, if there is always this, this craving for learning or this craving for knowledge that we see, especially in the, the bourbon or the whiskey community. And it's just people who want to learn more. And by, by offering this up to people, you know, that that gives them an insight that they might not be able to, to otherwise attain. I mean, you know, even if it's th- this definitely goes beyond the uh, the pandemic right now, too. Th- this definitely goes to people who are in foreign countries that can't make it to the United States to experience the the distilleries themselves or. Uh, that you know might not just be able to afford it or or whatever. So I think that there are definitely merits to be given to them. I uh, I and you know Buffalo Trace I think has done it exceptionally well. I mean you are literally going through a 3D recreation of their entire distillery. I mean it's it's wild. You're going into Rick houses. You're going into. Uh, the barrel receiving building you are checking out. Um, I mean, j- just a vast amount of information that <laughs> other distilleries haven't done, at least in Kentucky. So I would be uh, interested to see whether or not more distilleries start to do this while they're in uh, while they're in shutdown. You do bring up an interesting point with this, though. There's certain things that we can't see in a distillery just because of safety reasons. Like they're never going to bring us in, you know, right next to a, a giant truck unloading barrels and barrels of stuff just because we can't That's get that close. So are they showing like exclusive stuff that me as a person showing up to the distillery can't just walk up to? Uh, from what it looks like, yes. Uh, unfortunately, my Mac would not download the software uh, to do the virtual tour, so I I can't give an in depth review of it. But uh, uh, otherwise, it does seem like it is pretty immersive uh, in that sense. Because I feel like that would be a game changer if you've got something exclusive to this virtual tour that I can't just go to the distillery and see. You know? Sure. 
Like what sure. if Harlan's doing a explaining it, you know, as opposed to the tour guide, I just happened to get it for roses. That would be an interesting take in a, in a different way for the Buffalo trace to approach it. Um, but if, if we're talking about the way that they did kind of uh, take this on, it seems like it was just more, it was more uh, self-guided, I would say. Okay. Yeah. The 3d renderings are really, really great though. They're impressive. They are impressive. So let's move into some of the releases that have uh, been uh, announced and also some TTB labels uh, that have come across the desk this past week. Uh, the first one is the Blood Oath Pac-9. Or excuse me, Pac-9, Pac-6. If I could just read, that would really help me out. We're jumping like three releases ahead. Goodness gracious. They'll get there. Uh, yeah, eventually. Uh, but no, it's Blood Oath Pac-6. Uh, it's supposed to be released next month. Um, th- this one, look, I will be surprised if this actually meets the release date of April 2020. I mean, we're we're recording this, well, a day before April 2020. So. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if it's going to make it. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> I... Have I have not had much in the uh, in the Blood Oath series, um, but just just going off of the uh, going off the, the the products that actually have gone into uh, this one bottle, um, which is a combination of fourteen year rye bourbon, eight year rye bourbon, uh, a seven year rye bourbon, uh, and all that finished in cognac barrels. I I mean it sounds pretty inviting. You know, I I could I could get on board with it. It is a uh, a Luxro uh, distillery product, so I've not really had anything bad from Luxro either. So, you know, just kind of going off of track record, this could be stellar. But I don't know; it's still fetching a uh, a pretty hefty price point, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it is, and they. It says that they've got a mere 17,000 cases. Mere. Yeah. Which I I can't remember how these show up. I think they actually might come in cases of three. That sounds right. So they, they've got a decent amount of these. One thing I thought was kind of interesting is they've actually done with Pact 1, 2, and 3 a uh, a set. Like they did all three in one set. And down further in this article that they put out, it says that uh, 1,400 bottles of this one-time limited edition release for a future trilogy set. So it seems like they're doing, Mm -hmm. you know, a trilogy and then another trilogy. Those are going to be super collectible if you've already got one of the first first trilogy sets. So those will be really limited, but the actual bottle itself, it seems like they're going to have plenty of them. And going back to the, uh, is it going to make the release date type type of thing? What's your guys' thoughts on this Cass Cartel, Hollywood's most trusted online premium spirits marketplace, and you can uh, have an easy, mobile-friendly online ordering, guaranteed doorstop uh, delivery? If it delivers to you, I'm all for it. I don't think we're applicable for that yet. You, no, we're we're definitely not. But so I I don't know, man. We haven't seen a, an interruption really in home delivery as of yet, right? So I I mean th- this is totally dependent on whether or not do, w- the the shipping gets stunted based on the pandemic. Yeah, but. You know, it. I I don't know. Maybe well, they made the right choice. But true. But but maybe they made the right choice by, you know, selling it through this online market. But Kentucky can't get it yet. But it's a Kentucky product. You know, going back to what Swan was saying, uh, House Bill four fifteen passed, uh, which allowed shipping of. Uh, liquor and wine right to to kentucky 
Yeah. I, or at least within Kentucky. And I mean, that's not going to go into effect for a bit. So this, it, it, it is very interesting to me <laughs> that there's not a more widespread release of this. You know, I, I will give them this though. I went to the liquor store the other day and I kind of knew something that I thought would be on their shelves because I had seen it there before and it's a drive through liquor store as well, but it's also, you can go in and look. When I asked for this product, the lady looked at me like I was wearing 15 pairs of glasses. I mean, she just had this thousand yard <laughs> stare and could not figure it out. So kind of, you know, with this April, 2020 release date, and it being a limited quantity, rare, not familiar to a cashier or a, you know anybody that works at a liquor store, unless you're the guy that's like, you know, he'd been there for years. There's, they may not know what this is, and they if you go through a drive-through and ask for it, they're gonna look at you like they looked at me. So maybe you know, putting this online, uh, what would you say? What was it? Cast Cartel was just a yeah. Uh easy way for people to do that because they know that some liquor stores are going to be closed. Like I think Indiana had talked about doing that, but it's nothing's confirmed yet. I've just seen a bunch of fake articles on it. Um, and they just thought that would be a good solution. I don't know. I, I think it's kind of smart. Um, I do wish it was available everywhere, but we've gone, we've gone over that with, um, some of the heaven Hill stuff that's come out recently and done that same thing. I think that this, you know, we haven't even really talked about what this product might be like, um, even just based on their tasting notes. Uh, it says, starting with the nose of light caramel and toasted sugar and blossoming into tasting notes of spiced raisins and dark berries, followed by a creme brulee finish. I mean, that sounds delicious. Yeah, that it sound sounds good. very, very good. So I, I, I am interested in trying it uh, if we can get a hand, uh, uh, get our hands on it, rather very soon but who's to say man who's to say perry i might be able to get you some of the toasted barrel finished one they did which i believe was packed four Ooh. i think i know some okay. with an open bottle we, we can definitely try to get some on the show and see if uh what we think of it we'll we'll work out something i'm sure yeah at some point well uh let's talk about the ttb releases uh from this week i'm uh, excited i it, Me so I, as well. I want to I want to take a step back because I realize that not everybody knows uh, what the TTB is. This is the Alcohol Tobacco Trade Bureau, uh, and everything that gets released to the public has to actually be approved through the TTB. Um, so what we're pulling from are these approved labels uh, that can be found on their website. It's ttbonline.gov. Uh, And it's the COLA registration, C-O-L-A registration area. Um, It's kind of a difficult website to navigate, but it does have a heap of information. Um, And actually one that I forgot to uh, drop in for you guys to to talk about. Um, But we'll we'll get to that in, in just a second. The first one, though, is crazy. This is really, really cool. Uh, this is from the Razor Hog Spirits. It's a, high, a, a Hawaii bourbon whiskey. This is the first whiskey, bourbon whiskey out of Hawaii, which means that we now have bourbons in all 50 states. Don, I'm going to cool. need you to ship me a bottle. straight. Yeah, Don, away. shout out to you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, I know that it says that it's a minimum of six, on, uh, six months. But it, it, it just, it's definitely the principle behind it. Yeah. Yeah. So it says distilled <laughs> from grain on the, on the back. <laughs> <laughs> they know there's stuff oh. out there. Oh, yes. We're really getting an insight into uh, what the, uh, what the mash bill is. But um, I, I am excited for this. I don't know what the distribution is going to be like at all, but shoot man this is exciting yeah i'm excited about it just to just to have all 50 states be represented that's pretty cool did you see the uh established in 2014 by uncle carl willy wonka of alcohol oh my gosh no where is that 
It says the, it's the first paragraph. How awesome is that? Wow. Oh my gosh, that is so great. So I guess that means in a few years we're going to see a like a golden label that's sent out that <laughs> if somebody finds one, um, they get a free trip to the distillery. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Fly us out. What makes him the Willy Wonka of alcohol? Exactly. Um, Is it like if a- we're if we're getting into it, a hundred percent locally made uh, pineapple spirit and vodka. Breadfruit spirit, cane rum, pink Maui gin, ginger honey cordial, Kona mule, Oahu cream, uh, Lilikai liquor, bamboo booze, rice whiskey. Schnozberry whiskey. Yeah, yeah, do we? (laughs) Whiskey, brandy, Hawaiian style. Uh, Let's see, vodkas. Do you want me to keep going? The further you get into the list, the the lower my excitement gets because it seems like their specialty is not bourbon whiskey. <laughs> this is definitely like one of those boxed wine companies that just put out like a bourbon in boxes. Did you see those? No. I think uh, I think it, it might have been Boda Box, but they make like boxed wine and they have one that's just like bourbon or whiskey or something in one of the boxes. They still have this. I think so. I'll have to, I'm, I'll look it up, but um, uh, I'm excited about the next one we've got on this listing. I am too. I, th- this is going to be the first distillate that we see from castle and key, much like uh, the pin hook rye, uh, which we reviewed uh, a little bit back. Yeah. The ride on, uh, which was the first castle and key rye that was distilled there. This is the Pinhook Bohemian Bourbon, which is clocking in uh, at 98.5 proof. It is non-chill filtered. And this is a three-year-old distillate coming from Castle and Key. Now, I don't want to be negative Nancy. I don't want to be Debbie Downer. Yep. Get into it, Perry. But the the rye that we had from, from the Castle and Key distillate that... Uh, that the, that went into the pinhook bottles was not that great. No, it wasn't. I'm I've <laughs> got my hopes up though. I wanna I want to see it be good just because I'm from Frankfurt and I want it to be good. Yeah, I am. I am keeping my hopes up very high for it. Uh, just because. Uh, we're looking at it. This will be the uh, first Kentucky Straight Bourbon whiskey from the distillate. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Maybe the rye wasn't where we wanted it to be, uh, but it's a different product. So let's see what happens. I I understand where you're coming from, Kurt, but my, my immediate thought is, well, and, and it all goes into the grain that they use. It all goes into, you know, what, what kind of process they're, they're, using to to create the the whiskey itself yeah but i mean rye does it 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 takes on more of the the age at a at a quicker rate so you know two-year-old ryes don't always taste as young as two-year-old bourbons yes so i mean there is the opportunity for this to just kind of taste like younger corn whiskey so I I am cautiously optimistic, of course, about this one. I want to try it. I'll more than likely pick a bottle up because, you know, the collector side of me. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, having not been particularly impressed with the ride on release from Pinhook, I don't know. I, I don't think I, I i don't it's not that i don't think that it's going to be good it's just i don't know what to expect at this point yeah i'm just coming in with no expectations i think yeah 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 no i i hope that they can mimic what peerless has done because peerless put out a three-year-old bourbon that was honestly one of the best younger bourbons i think i've ever had it was very smoky kind of meat like and uh just really was 
well-rounded for three years old and didn't hit a bunch of those like high corn notes. But just based on the rye, again, cautiously optimistic. 98.5 is not the highest proof in the world, of course, but I mean, they they tout themselves for having, you know, bottled it at the the perfect proof. We'll see. That's all I can say. I, I again, am cautiously optimistic, but I would like to try it. Yeah. So, Swan, is is this the one that you were pretty excited about? Oh, I'm excited about these next two. Yeah, I know okay. I'm not Swan. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've talked about the Kings County Peated Bourbon. Yes, you have. As one of my favorite things I've tried last year. Um, still haven't splurged and got a bottle. I need to. I really need to hit up the guys at Kings County and see if I can get some even if i've got to you know pay for it just ship to me because i i love the stuff it's really good <laughs> yeah um but these next two are our new riff ian are you out there uh <laughs> I'm, I'm excited they're putting out a rye and a bourbon both with the same kind of finishing yeah it, well it, it's not necessarily finishing what they're doing is they are taking um sour mash I that use it uh, use it that used uh, a peat in it um, to impart a smokier flavor to the the whiskey itself. Uh, they are doing a rye release and they are also doing a bourbon release. Uh, both look to be bottled and bond and non chill filtered. So I mean we're looking at at least a four year old product coming from uh, from New Riff again. Which is super exciting. Uh, their rye is going to be 95.5, so 95% rye, 5% malted rye. Uh, and their bourbon is going to be 65% corn, 30% rye, 5% malted barley. Uh, th- this is the kind of innovation that excites me so much about places like New Riff, Wilderness Trail, uh, Kings County, for sure, since we're talking about uh, peated whiskeys, uh, peated bourbons. At the very least. So I I cannot wait to try this. Me too. Is this gonna be <laughs> their uh like their club that they have? Is how they're distributing it again? Because I know that that's what they did with the uh Balboa rye. Are they doing the same thing I, with these? I would say probably yes. Okay. Um it's got the same font, so I was worried that I'm not gonna be able to get a bottle of it. <laughs> Well, even if it has the same font, it uh, it doesn't have an actual label behind it, which would imply that it's probably going to be printed right on the bottle, uh, much like most of their labels are. I mean, if you look yeah. at the regular uh, New Riff bottle and bond, I mean, it, it's just right there on the bottle. It's not a label itself. Which, how do you get to be a part of that club? Just Or can you? Is it, you know, how does that work? Just curious for... It's subscription based, isn't it, Perry? Uh, well, I mean, you subscribe to the newsletter, but then uh, I mean that part of it is free, but you you pay for the bottles itself er, themselves. Yeah, uh, sure, when sure. They become available. So, I if I remember correctly, it's just at the New Riff website. Um, I'll I'll throw a link in the description below uh, for anybody to follow if they are not yet a part of that. So if you if you haven't joined that and that's the way to do it, you know, you can find that link below. So yeah, that's it. Um, just to continue on with interesting things that either came out this week or we found, I sent you guys a link in, in Zencaster for this boxed whiskey. Boxed whiskey. Yeah, I've got some information. Yeah, I've got some information on it. It's called Black Box Whiskey. Uh oh. Age six years, matured in American oak, expertly blended whiskey on tap. Yes. It's got the spout from boxed wine. Oh, man. Oh, man. Quarantine so, just got 8,000 times get a better. Box of this. Matured for <laughs> six years. Yeah. Now, that yeah, being said, it is in American proof. oak, but it's. It's true. But Perry, <laughs> it's in a box. <laughs> yeah well swan i hate to burst your bubble but it's not available in lexington right now you could drive to knoxville despite the uh the recommendation from our governor um 
to <laughs> no, I can't borders. make Andy mad. I can't make Andy <laughs> mad. <laughs> you can't be doing that. No, can't be. No can can't be. be. I also, it's not technically qualified as bourbon. It's American whiskey. It is a whiskey. Yep. Yeah, I don't know what they did to it to make it that way. I'm guessing it's a used mm-hmm. barrel or something. That's I mean, I'm thinking. yeah, because it doesn't say new charred uh, oak barrel. It says matured in American oak barrels. Ah, uh, yeah. Swan, I appreciate your uh, optimism, but I'm not sure, dude. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I want. Is my whiskey to sit in a plastic bag inside of a box on tap? In my fridge <laughs> on tap. I like below it says customers who viewed black box whiskey also viewed screwball peanut butter whiskey, uh, two stars <laughs> bourbon, which is the uh, total wine brand of bourbon, and yeah. 1792 bourbon. So we're really confused by the consumers on that one. <laughs> Yeah. Otherwise, thanks, Swan. <laughs> it's not even it's not even been reviewed. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Maybe we'll take it upon ourselves to review it. <laughs> you know what would be great? All right. If anybody can ship us a, a box of the boxed whiskey <laughs> for us to uh, us to review. Shoot shoot us a message, an email, whatever, at my bourbon pod. This is my bourbon shop at gmail.com. Some way, because I would love to try this and I'll tap it. We'll have a big box whiskey party once all of this passes. Or maybe I'll just, you know, drop off samples for you guys. But there will oh be boy. enough for samples, that's for sure. <laughs> well, and the best part is it's handles worth. It's an absolute gimmick because it's just a 175 that just happens to be in a plastic bag inside of a cardboard <laughs> box as opposed to glass. <laughs> but it's on tap. Like, I can't just tap the side of a glass Weller bottle and, you know, have everyone over. <laughs> I mean, you could, but it would not end well for you. Yeah, no, I'll just take a screwdriver and a hammer, <laughs> smack it real good, and then just as it's draining out, pour it into random, <laughs> random containers. <laughs> we do joke, but there are like a couple of those that you can flip the bottle and put it on tap. Oh yeah, oh that, that is yeah. true. That is very true. I've seen I don't upside think they, down I don't Jameson think, bottles. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I don't think this is the uh, the case. This is not. I'm not trying to attribute to that. I'm just saying we. You could have it on tap. They also make a tequila and vodka in the exact same box, also on tap. Okay, we're getting off topic here. That's my yeah, bad. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> move on. Ex- yeah, let's rein it back in and keep talking about these TTB labels. <laughs> so it was actually also revealed this week that uh, Wild Turkey has resubmitted a, a label for 101. Um, back in January, they had submitted a, a much smaller label uh, that was originally going to include an embossed uh, depiction of the wild turkey on the bottle. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they submitted a new one recently that I guess got reapproved. Uh, that is all paper and has the turkey actually printed on it. Um, Preconceived notions aside, based on what I did for my senior project and how similar the original one is to what I did, um, ask me about that elsewhere because I will I will be happy to share the similarities between those two. Um, I am not a fan of this new Turkey 101 label. But I'm still going to drink it. And that's the important <laughs> part, Perry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I mean, if it looks worse than the label does now. Well, Wild Turkey has never been one to blow anyone away with their styling. They just kind True. of people just know it's decent product inside. So at this point, they decent. can literally what do you yeah. Mean, I was say, hold well, on, Swan. I say decent because there's people like Kurt who don't okay. like 101, All right? <laughs> and then there's people like us who think it's the holy grail of budget whiskey. And so just kind of meshing it together, it's decent. But 
I mean, honestly, they can why, put. Why don't you put, at me next time, Swan? <laughs> I will. I'll put it in the chat right now at Kurt Con. Let's go. <laughs> but I mean, it really good whiskey. Honestly, they could put a glass bottle with masking tape on it. This is wild turkey, probably, and I would take it home for sixteen ninety nine. <laughs> I mean, it's wild turkey if you're lucky. Yeah, I I don't think they have to worry about what label they're putting on it. To be honest. This is a whole conversation that I want to approach in the future um, about whether or not the the branding of a bourbon affects whether or not you're willing to purchase it. And I know that we've talked about graphic design with, with bourbon and whiskeys in the past, but I think that there is more to be said now as the consumer culture has changed and I would kind of like to revisit that topic here sometime soon. Yeah, I'd be but, very interested in doing that. Yeah, that that being said, this label was a big swing and a miss for me. I feel like with this label, it might be a swing and a miss for you just because of what the like what you were expecting that had like you had visually like saw you know. Or you have what do you seen, mean? Because you had seen that it had, you know, it was going to have an embossed turkey kind of deal, right? Yes. So I feel like maybe that's why you're a little underwhelmed, maybe. Or is that not not the case? I, I totally like straight shooter. I just was curious. Yeah. No. I I think that the the layout of this label just feels really clunky to me. It looks right. really busy. It, well, it's it's not that it feels busy. I think that the I think that the information is presented very well. I think that you are looking at it and you know what products you're picking up. But in terms of the 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 amount of space that is used with that information, it seems like they don't know the difference between positive and negative space. And this is totally getting into <laughs> the graphic designer side of it. Yeah. But like the Turkey seems so out of place at the top of the label. Right. I think if we look at what they had submitted to the TTB in January, or at least got approved in January, it feels more concise it feels more like a label that in in it could be any size label honestly it could be what they have with uh well maybe not any size label and i apologize i meant to say bottle when i said label um but it could be any size bottle and i think that it could still kind of read well but the there is just something so odd and not comforting I think about the the new one that they submitted that I I don't know it it seems like they tried to accommodate everybody but for the sake of what I mean yeah for me the the only question it seems to me like the 101 in the back uh behind Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey it's a little too close to the wild turkey uh for my liking especially on uh what side is that is that on the front sorry I, yeah I'm, that's the, that's the front label yeah um so i feel like it's a little too close to the wild the r of the turkey um so i definitely see that uh the turkey i do i think they're I, i'm not I think the lockup, how this is presented is not, I think it's like good. I don't think it's bad by any means. I just think there's a couple things for me that I'm like, all right, why is the 101 behind the Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey? I feel like there's probably a better place for that maybe. Uh, and it just feels like the 1 and the R is a little too close. Um and I would like to see. I haven't <laughs> this seen is, this. Is every graphic design class that we had in uh, in college <laughs> exactly? And I'd like to see the uh, the old one compared to the newest one because I haven't seen that. But um, but yeah, I sent I, it to you. You did? Oh, they're both. Yeah, 
Okay. So wh- which one's the new one? So the new one is the top one with the turkey on the label. Yes. And the old one is the one without the turkey. Oh. Yeah, I still agree. I, I think the old one without the turkey is probably better, but I understand that they wanted to have the turkey in there because they're wild turkey, and I'm sure all their bottles probably have something like that. <laughs> but I still agree. I And actually, so going from the old one, I think the spacing on the new one is better on the 101 to the R. There's more spacing between that. Do you see that? Yeah, no, I definitely do. And and it's not just between the the 101 and uh Wild Turkey in general, but the uh where where it says Master Distiller Jimmy Russell. Yes, yes. So on the new one, I really appreciate the extra spacing but on Wild Turkey, the 101 and the R and the Master Distiller Jimmy Russell. I think that's awesome. I do I the the turkey at the top, I think that Maybe we just lose the turkey and and go back to what we were thinking, but with the better spacing. Yeah, I have to agree. Anyway, I have to agree. Anyway, that was graphic design corner with uh, Barry and Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> I think Swan fell asleep. Swan, you still with us? Uh, much like college, I dropped out of that conversation. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but no, I'm good. I'm still here. That's just fine. Okay. Sorry. Sorry yeah. about that. I, I'm. I'm sure that I have edited that down to a much more, uh, much more listenable <laughs> conversation. Yeah, and I, I'm, I didn't realize that we were looking at both the old and the new. Yeah, I apologize for that. So, well, that does it for the uh, for the news of the week of the releases of the week. So, I figure, guys, it's time to move into a review. And uh, w- what's been fun about the lockdown, if there is anything fun to be said about the lockdown, is that I can blind Curtis and Swan on reviews. And so what we're going to do is we are going to go through nose palette finish uh, before we get to price when I will actually reveal what the product is. So everything is going to be blind for you guys uh, until... I let you know what it is that you are actually drinking. Uh, so I gave them five samples. Uh, last week, we reviewed the Chattanooga 111 proof bourbon whiskey. And they have no idea what they're drinking this week. This is sample B out of A through E. Yeah, and I How went do you guys feel about a few minutes ago just to let it open up. Yeah, I did the same. Me as well. When we're apart, we still do the same things. Amazing. Apparently so. Apparently so. We we have gotten in that rhythm, thankfully. This is kind of a hot smell. Like the ethanol's apparent on the nose for this one. I would agree, but I also I'm getting a chocolate covered pretzel. Oh no! I absolutely am getting that, Kurt. Cool. Yeah, cool. I get like that brininess that you get off of like a pretzel or a bagel. Yes. Yes. Not necessarily getting the chocolate, but I can kind of see where you're coming from. It's got like a, uh, almost like a sweet note to it. That's I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, and honestly, I might I taste it. I, I might walk back the chocolate a little bit, but I definitely am getting a baked like a pretzel or a salty effect. Not like a car like a salted caramel, but definitely more of a baked kind of pretzel salt. I, I mean. It is kind of briny. <laughs> yeah. There's a brininess to it. Oh, but you know, I just got into the palate. It doesn't carry much over from the nose, but this is, this is nice. The finish on Ooh. this is apparent. It is long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is like, so in the pocket. In terms of in in terms of bourbon, I mean, like the nose is inviting, but the palate changes it up just a little bit. The finish, it just like it starts to kind of explode in pockets, too. Yeah, that finish right? is strong, man. Yeah, the palate yeah. it opens up, 
and gives more of a, it gives you a little more of that fruit, a little more of what you're thinking in bourbon, more of the caramel baked goods compared to the straight brininess of the nose. But the experience overall on this is fantastic. So as I go back to the nose, I start to smell more floral notes and it starts to kind of evolve into, I mean, whether it's like gardenia or honeysuckle, it's definitely still present and it kind of couples well with these, these honey notes that start to kind of layer themselves throughout the nose and even into the traditional bourbon flavors that you would expect uh, when you, when you approach a a bourbon whiskey. Um, So I, I think that it's actually got quite a, bit of depth to it i i and and i i mean correct me if i'm wrong but the color is quite quite nice as well Mm -hmm. it is i am having one issue with it though it is a lot of the same thing so imagine if you had like a meal where like your appetizer was a steak your dinner was a steak and then your dessert was another steak steak? (laughs) yeah as amazing as that sounds, you would probably be, you know, looking at your dessert like, oh my gosh, do I have to finish this? Like it is, it is a lot. This doesn't have a ton of variance. I'm looking for like some citrus or something a little fruity to kind of break it up. And it is a lot of like brininess, tobacco, and like really lays into that vein for the entirety of it. There's not much to break it up. That tobacco is a really good note, by the way. All of it's fantastic. I just think that if one of those pockets in the finish was to kind of hit you with like kind of a bright citrus note, this would be out of the park. <laughs> I I would have to agree with you, Swan. Uh, it is a little, I mean, it's very, it's interesting because it's very complex in kind of the field it's playing. It's yeah. hitting every single note in the field that it's playing, like the, on, interesting. The, on the spectrum of the wheel. I'm getting like tobacco, a lot of leather, uh, kind of a salted uh, pretzel, more in these like darker savory notes, like a gravy, uh, something like that. Um, So I get where you're coming from on that. I do. I am. I was getting a little bit of what Perry was talking about on the nose. As you go further into it, it has more of a honey, uh, more of a a floral note to it. Uh, I do. I, I would agree. I do want a little more on the citrus or just the, the lighter side of that spectrum. I like that note of gravy, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. I, that, that is something that I am definitely picking up, uh, whether it's on the nose or the palate. Oh, this is, it's good. good. It is good. It makes me happy. It makes me happy, man. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, would you guys like to go ahead and reveal your scores for the nose, the palate, and the finish? Yeah. Do you want me to run through all three of them? Mm-hmm. Okay. If you so don't mind. The, the nose, I felt like on this was the most lacking, which is not a bad score for saying lacking. I gave it a three. I thought it was really good. That brininess is very apparent. The tobacco is definitely there, but it is a little ethanol heavy. It, it does kind of hit you, which is strange because going into the palate, uh, the ethanol's only, I mean, thing that it had was on the nose for me. The rest of it's very, very mellow, which is nice. I gave it a 3.5. This was where I started to get a little bit of, I, I'm going to call it fatigue. That's going to sound bad, but like it's a lot of the same all the way through and there's not a whole lot to break it up. Um, but it is again, that like kind of like white pepper gravy, tobacco, a little savory, some brininess, and then on to the finish where I thought it was the best out of everything. I gave it a 4.25. I think it's, it's really good. Again, it's a lot of the same, but it does change up a little bit. There's pockets of it. I got a little bit of like, um, a, a little bit of a of kind of a honeysuckle, not necessarily a fruit, but um, it, it broke it up just enough. And I think that where it just keeps going and it's a nice long finish and it's oily, really coats your mouth, it's a good finish. It's my favorite part of it. 
Nice. Yeah, so so for me on the nose, I gave it a three. Um, it, it's going to be similar to what Swan was, but a, a little different given. Um, so for the nose, I, I really enjoyed that kind of baked pretzel note. Um, and then as you came back to it and as it opened up a little bit and you gave it a second try, that's where it was like, okay, maybe we're getting a little more of this honeysuckle. Maybe we're getting more of these uh, traditional notes of what you were talking about. Uh, so I gave it a three for that. The palette, this is, uh, for me, it, it enhances it. It kind of hits that steak note. It hits the, the uh, white gravy. It hits all of those savory notes that, you're, that we were talking about. Uh, and I think it's really nice. It's, it's super savory, though. I, I, I think it, that's where it's like, okay, this is, I, I really, really like this. But it does have a little bit of like, okay, but I just need a little something more um, just to give it a little variance. Um, so going on to the finish, this is where this was the high point for me as well. I gave it a four. It, it is that oily. It's that that kind of when you when you swallow it, it kind of has this uh, flare of going back to your nose and kind of gives this nice uh, Kentucky hug finish. I I really, really like that within that. Uh, So three, three and a half, and then, then four on the finish. So we all kind of have, um, I would say similar ranges of scores. I, they're not necessarily the, the same points, I I gave the nose a three. I think that it is really quite unique uh, in terms of what you would find on on a bourbon in this day and age. Uh, But at the same time, it's not necessarily the one that I would go back to and go, yeah, that that's something that I want to uh, I want to get more invested in. Uh, I gave the the palette a three point five. I think that's where things really kind of started to ramp up. Uh, that's where I, I started to be able to dissect things and realize that there was complexity to it. Uh, and then the finish, I actually gave a 3.75. Um, I, I think the finish just lends itself so well to everything that you were getting on the nose and the palate uh, while kind of starting to develop into those darker tobacco notes um, you can definitely pick up on the the spice of the barrel, the the char of the barrel as well, uh, as you you let the the finish kind of rest, uh, and and you you take some time with it. So I I think that the finish is quite spectacular. Would you guys like to know what it is that we're tasting? Well, we need uh, to know the, the price. price. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's you don't even price. know the price. The price of this bourbon. Does anybody have a guess first? I'm just curious. Uh, I'm going to go with 70. I'm going with uh, 60. (laughs) That is amazing. This is a $15 bottle of bourbon. Holy shit. (laughs) Good, 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 good. Okay, I thought it was going to be some overpriced kind of like craft stuff. That's what I was expecting. This is the seven-year-old 101 proof virgin bourbon virgin from bourbon. Heaven Hill. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes. 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 Uh, which is actually not available in Kentucky. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's only available in like North and South Carolina. Maybe just North Carolina, uh, if I'm if I'm correct. But th- this is. An exceptional bottle of whiskey. I, I am. Th- this was our answer to the the six year Heaven Hill bottle and bond. I mean, it is exactly the same distillate, exactly the same distillery. I uh, one year older and one proof point higher, and I I, I haven't blinded it uh, with its I would say sister products, um, but. I I think that this kind of stands up and I'm not trying to break the market again, 
or get people tuned into in a, any kind of secret. But it's a daggum good bottle of bourbon. <laughs> and just to reiterate, go ahead and say the name again. Virgin Bourbon. It's 101 proof, and it's, uh, well, it used to be seven years old. I don't know if it still is, um, but it's available in, at the very least, uh, the southeast portion of the U.S. Gotcha. It's good. It's yeah. good. I think price-wise, I'm going to put this at a five. For me, I put it, I, I mean, I'm at a four and a half. I'm going to go 4.75. Just because, I mean, wow. <laughs> I gave it a 4.5. So, I mean, we're, we're all in the same boat. You know, it, it's, it is rare to find this complex of a, a low age, well, a, a low priced age stated whiskey uh, that has this much depth to it. I mean, th- this is by and large one of the unsung heroes in in the bourbon game right now and you know look if you're if you're in the carolinas buy at least a bottle <laughs> at the at the very least i mean th- this this should be this could very well be the next heaven hill six year bottle in a bond yes i agree <laughs> you know, so, I'm throwing my hands up because yeah, I'm. <laughs> I mean, I know that puts me that puts me at a fifteen point two five, and honestly, could be a fifteen and a half. Yeah, that puts me at fifteen point seven five. Yeah, I gave it a thirteen point seven five. But but at the same time, it's still a win for me. It's still a recommend. Oh yeah. So I guess if you're in the Carolinas, uh, go and pick up a bottle of Virgin Bourbon, uh, one one proof. It's Heaven Hill Distillate. It's real good. I uh, Swan, you asked for questions in the uh, in the Facebook group. This is my bourbon group uh, where you can become a member of a really fun community if you have not already done so. But you are a listener of the show. What 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 questions do you have for us, Swanee? So I got one of the classics. How did you get the nickname Swan? This is from Don Sheeta. Uh, also Swan, a pear bear, and is there a nickname for Curtis? So the the first part of the question there, how'd you get the nickname Swan? Uh, right as soon as everybody was switching over to pretty much primarily having iPhones, it was a uh, it couldn't figure out my name, Sean S E A N, and it swapped the E for a W, and everyone's autocorrect, and so I just became Swan when everyone messed up in group chats, and it just stuck. <laughs> and then, yeah and we've never let you forget that no it was like two times and and then it just forever <laughs> um and is there a nickname for curtis kurt do you have a nickname i don't but i've been i have been somebody come up with one please i think we should put it out to the uh facebook group and and say all right here's the come up with a nickname yeah. for curtis that's a great way to do it all right cool yeah let's do that keep looking at kurt backwards it's truck (laughs) (laughs) without the k (laughs) yeah unless you thought my name was spelled with a k no no kurt (laughs) okay yeah Yeah, okay okay, cool uh so next one's from Dustin Whitaker. if you could release your own bottle slash expression which distillery would you go with and what would be the recipe slash blend proof, et cetera. Uh, this one's hard. This one's very hard because everyone's going to naturally want to say Buffalo trace just because that's what would sell. But at the same time, if I'm coming out one with one for just me, it'd be so close to Elijah Craig. It would pretty much just be Elijah Craig, <laughs> uh, maybe with some extra proof points. So, uh, I don't know. That one's hard. The virgin bourbon's pretty good, but I think if I could get some weird four grain blend that was between Larceny and Elijah Craig, that was barrel proof and a good blend of those, which I'm not sure what that would be. I would gravitate towards that. Yeah. I was going with more of like, I was, I was thinking the same thing of an an Elijah Craig. Uh, but if we're getting a little weird, I'll, I'll go with, uh, 
you know, try something a little new age, a little new, uh, a newer distillery, something of the likes of new riff. Uh, not exactly sure what the recipe and blend is, uh, because I mean, they're doing so many good things over there. Um, something in, in that proof point, I'd like to see maybe, a uh, 120 proof point. So I, I, I'd like to see that from new riff. So I, I think something like that. I, I don't disagree with you. I think that uh, places like New Earth and Wilderness Trail are doing really good things with their younger distillate. Um, but it, it's just so hard for me to not go like, you know, Wild Turkey, Heaven Hill, Jim Beam. Yeah. You know, and and I I would probably lean more towards the 120, 125 proof range. Um and even then, you know, I would probably cap it off at like 10 years. Yeah, that's a good age for turkey. Yeah, and, and you know, there have been fantastic Knob Creek picks at 10 to 14 years, and, and even down to nine. Yeah, um, I'm thinking, as as far as age goes, I'm thinking like a 12 to 14. I know New Riff can't do that, but... Yeah, maybe one day. You never know. Their OKI stuff was anywhere between eight, ten to twelve, and it was finished. Yeah, true, but that things. was that was MGP sourced though. Yeah, but I mean, they're they're definitely capable of you know down the line, should they have stuff that age, kind of curating something to taste decent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so Great next, question, though. That's awesome. Yeah, next yeah. one's from Joseph Brazo, the man. You have a the you man, have to give, the legend. Yeah. <laughs> you have to give a Martian a single bottle of bourbon to take back to his people and the best representation of all bourbon. What are you giving him? I'm assuming the Martian is he. It's hard to tell with him. <laughs> <laughs> uh Elijah it, Craig. It is I was I was gonna say, I feel like it's easy to say like a Heaven Hill or an Elijah Craig product because I mean that allows for people to you know fall in proof love. it down if they need to or, or fall See, in love with okay. for sure here's my yeah. here's my my thing no proofing down none of that i'm going with an elijah craig barrel proof <laughs> because if you're a marchin you're used to some of this stuff you're used to this high proof high like intensity kind of liquid like what I think if you're a Martian, you're used to that kind of stuff. So I'm going with an Elijah Wait, Craig. What are you proof. basing these claims on? Yeah, they could drink water and think, man, this is spicy. Like, you don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm basing it off of just like mayonnaise is spicy. I'm basing this off of that the human race hasn't come to, uh, to like have the most technology, the extent of what Martians have. And if they're able to come down and get bourbon, I think that they want something higher proof. That's fair, I guess. I mean, I don't have anything to say against it. So I'm going barrel proof. I think they can handle it. I I would offer up barrel proof to them, and then they can decide what they want to do with it. But, you know, if if I had to, I guess, pick one bottle, it would be, I don't know, Elijah Craig Craig. A120? All right. Uh, so the next question is from Blake Upchurch. If you had only one bourbon you could drink for the rest of your life, what would it be? Any price or availability? And which one bourbon would you drink if the price availability did matter? So I guess it's kind of one attainable, one non-attainable, or at least frequently attainable. Um, if I had to pick, I think I would drink non-attainable, the Elijah Craig 139.4. The barrel proof release they did. I think I would definitely go for that. And attainable. Uh, I mean, you want to say Elijah Craig again, but I, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to go for another higher proof. Probably Knob Creek single barrel. Yeah, I've said this before on as far as attainable goes. I think I'm going to go with like a Booker's just because you get multiple releases. It's different. It tastes good. Um and has a higher proof, more complexity, kind of something like that. If we're just going straight, like, 
this is what bourbon should be. It's tough to beat Elijah Craig. Um, but continuing on to the, uh, if price and availability, availability didn't matter, that's a tough one because that opens up a whole lot of avenues. <laughs> I don't know if I, I can pick one. Yeah. I, so uh, I, I feel slightly biased based on, you know, what's been happening recently and, you know, whether or not 120 proof whiskeys or alcohol can actually kill illnesses. Um, but <laughs> I mean, it, sure it's hard trying. not to say, I uh, no, I definitely am too. Um, it's hard not to say something like, you know, Knob Creek single barrel or bookers or, uh, you know, Elijah Craig barrel proof, something in that vein. Um, I, I think that, I would have to go Elijah Craig barrel proof. It's hard not to. Really, I'd be surprised. Uh, I, I'm. I'd rather see you pick like Booker's Rye or something. If you could just like unattainable, have it all the time. Really, mm. I feel like that that was probably second for me because the one small sip I had of that was phenomenal. That and Booker's Thirtieth. Oh, okay. I I apologize. I misread the question. Um. Only one bourbon, uh, regardless of price and availability. Oh, man. See, even then, I want to get into, like, Dusty's. I mean, because... In the supply of 1993 Wild Turkey 101. Well, no, 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 yeah, not I totally necessarily. jumped over Dusty's. That, that's a good good point. I mean, like, what, what if we had a barrel-proof Taylor from you know the the 1920s or the 1930s perry (laughs) you see what i'm saying like there there are so many options at that point yeah (laughs) i mean that sounds fantastic and i have no idea what that would even taste like but i imagine that it would be heaven in a glass so yeah we could we could debate about it all all day day. yeah exactly exactly yeah Uh, the next question is from Jason Robbins. What other, if any, bourbon podcasts or YouTube channels do you watch or listen to regularly? It's uh, Bourbon so Night. The two that I listen- <laughs> yeah, it's Bourbon Night, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I watch a lot of the Mash and Drum and uh, the Whiskey Vault. The mm-hmm. Whiskey Vault's really nice for kind of opening me up to a lot of local stuff that I'd like to try when I travel. Uh, but the Mash and Drum, generally, the reason I like watching him is he's... Uh, a lot of his reviews, like the strictly just the reviews, are pretty no nonsense. It's what's like, do I want this whiskey or do I not? Based on yeah, you know his review. So a lot of them I I watch, and it's more of a money saving thing than anything, or a money wasting thing, depending on how <laughs> how he reviews. Because huh. my my palate does align quite a bit with his, and that's Jason from the Mash and Drum. Yeah, for me, I. I watch a lot of uh, It's Bourbon Night as well. And then uh, I've actually been listening to a lot of uh, Bourbon Pursuit. Uh, my my roommate, he, he um, brought home the book Bourbon Justice. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he wrote, he wrote the, perp- the one of the persons who, guys who makes uh, Bourbon Pursuit does, made uh, bourbon justice right well he's on the uh the community round table from time to time brian uh hara hara yeah yeah i apologize okay yeah, yeah um so i might have been wrong on that one a little bit um but i've been listening to them quite a bit um i definitely want to get to uh let's go to the next question are we doing all yeah. of them yeah why not yes. we'll run through them let's do a lightning round we'll finish them all yeah we'll let, let's do a lightning round all right. Any recent bottles that you've revisited during isolation? You realize you should have been having more, or realized why you stayed away. Uh, this is from Eric Smith. For me, the Bell Mead cask finish stuff. I should have been paying more attention to. It needed to open up. I will give you that. It was way too strong initially. Uh, for me, I d- I retried <laughs> the Oregon Spirit, and I still stand oh, by. Boo. Yeah, and I still stand by that you should not have that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> look look for me anything is on the table i mean i i will try basically anything at this point you know whether it's 
you know, something I didn't like in the past or something that I have some slight affinity for. Uh, but I am constantly reviewing whiskeys that I have opened recently or, or even not recently uh, to determine whether or not I like them. So, okay, this is, this is fun. Yeah. Continue the lightning round, Swan. What, what do you find to be the most challenging part of putting yourself out there every week on podcast slash YouTube from Ted Graham? Oh, all right. I'll start Man, with this one. That is that is a uh, deep question. <laughs> that is. Yeah. No, I'm uh, terrified of people. Uh, so the fact that I'm not just screaming into the void, uh, that's that's scary in itself. Um, Perry's is apparently when truckers decide to hijack our podcast. No, look, look, <laughs> look. I have no idea what happened with that. And it is freaking me the heck out. Look, Patreon is going to get that audio 100% uncut, but holy crap, I have no clue what happened. I mean, there there is a whole segment, and I am so sorry, because the last bit of this podcast has just been me, like, above 100% energy. What? I, I, don't, I don't even know. It sounded like somebody was, like breaking into the matrix to try to pull me out that's and exactly what it's been perry has been so thrown off by this i don't i don't even know what to do man like, everybody has been but it's been wild uh, um just to, what are we even talking about <laughs> uh perry what do you find yes. to be the most challenging part of putting yourself out there every week on podcast slash youtube Staying relevant is something that I have really tried to be cognizant of um, over the past few months, uh, making sure that we are talking about things that I, people might be interested in or care about, uh, while also, you know, providing uh, insight or commentary on not just what is, but what has been and potentially what is to come. So, the, the the podcast has changed so much, especially when uh, we hear from somebody who is not even on the podcast and decides that they're going to Skype in from an uh, uh, undisclosed location and it really, really screws me up. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, for me, I think what Perry hit on staying relevant and, and also trying to uh, keep up and progress as as you do the uh, the podcast. That that is something that has been for me um, a challenging part is to keep progressing in how you think about bourbon, how you taste bourbon, uh, the knowledge you know about this kind of stuff, the industry. That is that is a very uh, challenging aspect of it. So I would say that. And then uh, also just being true to to yourself on what do you think of this bourbon? Because it's easy to say, uh, "Oh yeah, I really like this bourbon," but if you don't actually like it, um, you know that that's a tough aspect to do. Is you should be truthful in in how you experience whatever you're having, and uh, to the audience and to the listeners. Uh, so that that is that's something, and I think that's something that us as a podcast has done really well has been true to who we are and what, what we think about uh, bourbons we try and we review. All right. So the next question is which tiger King character are you most like? Oh, I, I most like the guy who didn't testify. Um, shoot. What's his name? He doesn't have legs. Oh, <laughs> that guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like the the guy who's like just kind of along for the ride, and like if if I didn't take charge of my own life, I would have just kind of been you know going yeah whatever. Um, but he he's so like man that sucks. I was really trying to be a part of something special, and then it all kind of fell apart. That is totally me. Like if if <laughs> if if I had to insert myself in that series. It would be the guy who mostly knows what's going on, but is still happy regardless. And he also has no legs. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, for me, it's the the girl that got her arm ripped off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
because <laughs> she just doesn't seem to care at all. <laughs> you want to talk about a long for the ride. She's just there. She just exists. <laughs> back to work the next day you know i mean she had what like I'm a week sorry, i'm sorry i'm sorry that that is so perfect for you swan <laughs> what about uh, you kurt uh, who are you well <laughs> um i was gonna say the girl who got her arm ripped off because <laughs> she's going well, along with the ride uh, <laughs> i feel like a lot <laughs> I feel like a lot of us just in life right now is uh, the girl who got her arm ripped off and went back to work the next day because I feel like, you know, this whole situation has been putting us in that uh, that kind of time uh, mindset. Yeah, no, she's the uh, essential employee of, of Tiger King. Like <laughs> She's going to work anyway. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, I can't say that I'm Joe Exotic because I'm not crazy. Like, he's... Just crazy in a redneck, but I don't know. Uh, definitely not oh that. My gosh, Carol Baskin. Yeah. I didn't, you know, murder my husband. So <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, I, I I think I I would be with Swan's aspect on this one. Oh. I need to catch my breath. <laughs> Just got back to work, you know. <laughs> Maybe we should move on to the next question. Who shot first, Han or Greedo? Han did. Han. On um, shot first. Yeah. All right. No, <laughs> no question about it. Adam, <laughs> that was from Tyler. Uh, I can't pronounce that last name. I'm so sorry. I need just Pasteur. 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 There we go. Sweet. When Chad and Sarah get toasty, they become Chaz and Sarah. Sarah with an H. What are your drunk names? I become Sean. Um, I become. Oh shoot, fairy. <laughs> what, uh, yeah, fairy with an H. <laughs> uh, for me. <laughs> And I know this is very kind of anticlimactic, but uh, and this is a real thing. I just become drunk, Kurt. <laughs> like there's no describing it. It's just wow. Ah, there's there's drunk Kurt. There he goes. There he goes. Drunk I don't know. Kurt. Perry would probably be better at answering this question. I uh, I think Kurt becomes the lean. Um, the lean. or maybe the lean. Yeah, because you you just you rely on everybody else to hold you up at that point. Oh, okay, I get that. All right, you become yeah, the guy I mean, with no legs. Like, <laughs> he becomes Gumby. Yeah. All right, Curtis is Gumby when <laughs> when. <laughs> All right, I'm on board. All right, Kurt Gumby. Yeah, for real. Done. We need to figure out. Uh, we should put out a poll on what my name should be or my yes. name. We will do it. We will not definitely do it. Not just like when I get drunk, but but like just a nickname. Yeah. We'll make it happen. Uh, I right. we're we're not done. <laughs> we're not done yet. Yeah, uh, tips and bits. Gee whiz. What what an episode it's been. Yes, Swan, we do have tips and bits. I uh, what what do you guys have for tips and bits this week? Ozark season 3 and Tiger King. Heard nothing but good things about Ozark season three. It you it is worth watching season two again because season one is a very cohesive like full thing. You could tell they didn't know if they were going to get a second or third season. Um, they they line up a little bit, but it could be considered full. But after season two, they they you know left it wide open and season three picks right back up and goes just in <laughs> directions you would never expect. Uh, yes. Cause I, I've been watching Ozark, uh, season three and that, that's very good. Uh, my, uh, mine would be Westworld season three. Oh, okay. I have heard it's so good. It's very good. It takes it outside of, the uh west world kind of if, if you watch the first and second season um i'm not going to give too much away here but it goes outside of that west world uh and the kind of ecosystem that it's at and 
it gets very, very intense. It's super good. You definitely should watch. If you haven't seen the first season, you should go watch first, second, and third in probably a week um, and get caught up. They're releasing every episode Sunday at 9. Uh, right now we're on uh, season 3, episode 4. Uh, coming Episode 4 will be coming up. Uh, so that is my mine because it is phenomenal. Well, we just started watching Dave, Ooh. which is an unbelievably funny comedy about the rapper Lil Dicky. Who, <laughs> yeah, you uh, you can, you know, you can assume from there. But he is a comedian who is also a rapper, and a uh, really really funny show on FX. Um, and I'm definitely going to recommend a podcast as well. I just started the show tonight, actually. Um, I am one episode in, which is as far as this show is, too. It's called Why Is Cats? And it's all about <laughs> why the movie Cats actually exists. And I have not seen Cats yet, but I fully believe that I am going to love it much in the same way that people do either Rocky Horror Picture Show or The Room uh, uh, upon my first watch. So go watch or listen to, rather, Why is Cats? So that's it. Uh, thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode. I apologize for the weird looseness that happened <laughs> after the review I really got freaked out by that, uh, that I don't know, radio commentator that came in uh, that Patreon is going to hear for sure. Uh, Curtis and Swan, I hope you guys are being safe. Uh, where can people find you on social media while you are doing so? Um, um, so, oh, no. <laughs> uh, you want to fight, Kurt? No, but I'll go first. Okay. Um, so on Instagram, you can find me at Kurt Khan and on Twitter, Kurt underscore Khan 15. All right. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook at My Bourbon Finder. And you can find me at P 1492 on all social media platforms. Uh, you can leave the show a five star rate and review. No, sorry. Messed up. Uh, you can find the show at My Bourbon Pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can leave us a five star rate and review on iTunes, which is super helpful for us. We have gotten quite a few uh, ratings recently, uh, but not as many reviews. So if you would like for us to read out your reviews of the show, uh, it doesn't matter whether or not it's on iTunes, it could be on any platform. Uh, so feel free to leave those. We would be happy to read them out on air for you. Uh, you can find all of our apparel and merchandise at bourbonshop.threadless.com uh, We're going to try to throw up some kind of special for everybody who is uh, quarantined and uh, you'll, you'll get, I'm sure, free shipping. You can uh, call in for our barrel ring segment at 859-428-8253 uh, One more time, 859-428-8253 to leave us a voicemail uh, that we will respond to on the show here live and in living color. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, you can support the show at patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, and you get exclusive content at the $5 tier, like bonus episodes. You get the pregame chats, which come out every week, the day before the episode. Uh, you get to be able to hang out with us once a month uh, via Google Hangouts or something like that. You get live streams just for Patreon as well. Uh, all those can once again be found at patreon.com slash Podcast. I think that does it for this week of quarantine recording. Thank you all so much for listening next week. I have no idea what's going to happen, but uh, we'll be here nonetheless uh, nonetheless, rather, until then, I'm Perry. I'm Curtis. And I'm Swan. And this is My Bourbon Podcast. Bye, y'all.